why do people love Jesus? I'm guessing that if you're a Christian, there are people who know you that think you are weird or wrong or maybe a bit of both for claiming to love the God presented in the Bible. And if you aren't a Christian, I'm guessing that you probably have legitimate questions about why in the world anyone would claim to not only follow Jesus, but also love him. Maybe you're like a teenager I once knew who was scared of entering a church building. See, they thought that based on the lifestyle that they lived, that to enter a facility like that where a God of the Bible was proclaimed, that they would literally burst into flame. Like God would see them coming in and cause them to spontaneously combust because of who they are and what they were doing in their life. And I don't want to downplay stories like this because I think there are a lot of people that don't like Christians because they don't like the God Christians believe in, or at least the God that they think Christians believe in. Like, I'm always so curious to, to find out what people actually think I believe. I, I liked this, this one quote I saw on Twitter recently. A pastor had written that, tell me about the God that you don't believe in. Because chances are, I don't believe in that God either. So, so, let's, so let's be clear. Just because you hear the name Jesus used out there doesn't mean we're talking about the same Jesus. And just because you hear the word God used out there somewhere, even in a church, doesn't mean you are hearing about the God that I love. The God that the Bible actually presents. See, I think there's two really important questions that we all must ask at some point in life. Question number one, is God real? And question number two, what is God like? And today, we aren't going to unpack the answer to that very relevant first question, as important as that is to do at some point, but we are going to look at the answer to the second. Because regardless of what you've heard or thought or been taught about God thus far in your life, the answer to this question affects a lot about you. Your idea of God influences your interaction with God. It affects how you pray, if you pray. It affects how you think about your identity, how you think about the people around you, discussions about life after death. And the truth is that at some point, whether we want to or not, we will all have to address the answer to this question. What is God like? So it's important that we're clear on what Christianity teaches about this. And for Christians, we believe that what's recorded in the Bible accurately reveals who God is. And our, our passage today, Luke chapter 15, is, is such an important chapter. It, it foundationally presents to us who God is and then the picture that it gives us there. The opening lines of, of this scene that's uh, set 2,000 years ago between Jesus and his interaction with the religious leaders uh, invites us to understand and also to experience who God is and what he's like. And we're going to, as we go through this, there might be some terminology that's unfamiliar to you. I'll, I'll try to be as helpful as I can as we go. As we start reading here in Luke chapter 15, verse 1. Which says, now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him, Jesus. And the Pharisees and scribes grumbled saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. What's happening here is you have the religious people who lived a life of strict obedience to the law, to, to God's ways, looking at where Jesus is and who he's spending his time with. Why? Why Jesus? Why are you spending time with people like this? Because tax collectors in that time and people with the label sinner, they're those who are missing the mark. They're those who are falling short of God's ways. So why would someone who claims to be from God hang out with such a crowd? In their minds, this is what we would call scandalous. It's not something they would do and it's not something that they would want to be caught doing. So, so you know, it's like, Jesus, someone like you should not be spending time with these people. You shouldn't be welcoming them. You shouldn't be receiving them. To them, this is not what God is like. 
And so it's not what God's people should be like. But for Jesus, this is not the first or only time he's seen doing something like this. Luke draws our attention to this repeatedly. For example, in Luke chapter 5, And Levi made him, Jesus, a great feast in his house, and there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at table with them. And sharing a meal in that culture was a very meaningful thing. Verse 30, And the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I think they are frustrated because he's doing things differently than they thought he would. He's doing things differently than he ought to. And then he explains why, using three stories. And and it's in a style of teaching the Bible refers to as parables, a way of comparing and contrasting things by laying them side by side. And these three stories are going to make one point, that what Jesus does shows us who God is. It is like Jesus is saying, my activity here on earth reflects God's identity in heaven. So so Jesus, why are you welcoming sinners? Story number one. He told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. And most scholars think we need to take that ironically, like Jesus is saying, you know, you don't realize you need repentance, but you actually do. And we're not going to camp out long here because we want to spend uh, our time in, in especially the last story. But remember, where are we here? Jesus is speaking to leaders and teachers in the Jewish faith, and in a real sense, in their eyes, sinners were not objects of God's love. They were targets of God's destruction. Many scholars believe that actually that the idea of God going to search for sinners was not something that these types of leaders would have embraced. And yet God being a God who takes joy in saving people and finding the lost who have broken their relationship with him through through their rebellion, through falling short of his ways, through sin, this has always been what God is like. This is the story the Bible is telling, which is why we'd see in another place, like Ezekiel 34, this language of shepherd again, like Luke 15. For this is what the sovereign Lord says, I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. As a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he's with them, so I will look after my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on a day of clouds and darkness. And later I will search for the lost and bring back the strays. And this is hundreds of years before Jesus. And by the way, the imagery of God as shepherd is is curious because in that day and age, in the setting Jesus is telling this story, shepherds were considered in the same class of people as tax collectors and sinners. This imagery is jarring, perhaps even offensive. And the idea that God really wants to bring back people to where they belong, man, that's, that is stunning. And it's also further expanded in the next story we see. Jesus, why are you welcoming sinners? Story number two. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? In that world, a silver coin like this would have been very, perhaps extremely valuable depending on the woman's situation. Verse 9. And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, Rejoice with me, for I found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. When when we see these stories and the one that follows, we get the idea that sin is very real and it is very serious. and puts people in a place where they shouldn't be. Two, Two days ago, I was helping somebody try to find their phone. Their phone was missing and the phone was valuable to them and it wasn't in the place where they had left it. See, where they had left it was inside of their truck. But the problem was that an event occurred that moved that phone from where it ought to be to where it now was missing. A car accident, loud and crazy and surreal, took place right in front of my eyes. And now things that had been whole were broken. And things that had been safe and secure and where they were supposed to be were no longer there. 
And as I think about that story, I'm reminded of this, this is exactly the position we are in as humanity before God. See, at the start of the story of the Bible, God, the creator, creates a perfect world, one that is broken by what the Bible calls sin. This, this rebellious act that introduces brokenness and, and, and all of this stuff, separation from God. And if you are in that place, if you are separated from the source of life, that is not where you are supposed to be. So when Jesus is explained that God rejoices when people come back to him, that God celebrates when people are where they are supposed to be, he is showing this is necessary. It is necessary that I welcome tax collectors. It is necessary that I celebrate when sinners come home. Why? Because God is in the business of restoring things that were broken. That God is in the business of setting all things right. There is a God of love who wants to restore the lost and the broken and the hurting and those who are separated from him by their sin. And he joyfully wants to do this. The character of God is portrayed by a shepherd who searches for a lost sheep and a woman who searches for a lost coin would have been amazing, stunning, and perhaps offensive imagery to Jesus' audience. Wake up and see what God is like. You're upset that I'm here? Well, I'm upset that they are there. You're upset that I'm here welcoming sinners. I'm upset that they are separated from God. And Jesus is not done. The character of God is beautifully expanded from these first two stories in this last story, sometimes referred to as the parable of the prodigal son, but I think better referred to as the parable of the loving father. So again, Jesus, why are you welcoming sinners? Story number three. And he said, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son squandered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate and no one gave him anything. Let's pause here and make a few observations. It, we have to keep in mind that in this culture, in this, in this ancient Middle Eastern culture, the concepts of honor and shame were a very big deal. They were powerful, motivating factors. There were big dynamics at play, and it's harder for us to understand in, in a modern North American, Western culture, but, but keep this in mind as we think about what's happening in this story and as we examine some of the layers here. Knowing this, look at what is experienced by the father. The father is shamed by his son's request. By asking for his share before his father's death, it was the equivalent of saying, Father, I wish you were dead. One scholar writes this, property was customarily disposed by a will executed after a father's death, not by request when he was alive. It was regarded as unwise, though not exactly illegal, to dispose of a property during one's lifetime. The younger son's request shames both his father and his family. It's a certified public statement that he no longer wishes to live within or be identified by the family. In requesting what should become available only at his father's death, the son is in effect writing his father's death certificate. Jesus could stop here and not explain anymore because in that ancient Jewish society, this would have been virtually an unforgivable offense, but there's more. The father should be outraged at this point and put his son in his place. But look what happens next. The father is shamed, not only by his son's request, but by his son's departure. He's further breaking ties with his father and his family. This expression, distant or far country, can also be viewed as a metaphor. It's taking the relational alienation that they're experiencing and combining it now with physical distance. Another layer is that the father is shamed by his son's investment. He's further separating from the father and his family by spending his inheritance. So this property is not something to be valued and kept. It is cash to be spent. The father, you know, this is, this is yet another blow. And there's more. Another layer, the father is shamed now by his son's distance. And this, this idea that he's hiring himself out in verse 15, the, the word there means to bind oneself closely with, to, to cling to, cleave to. It's like I'm abandoning 
my family's identity, my Jewish identity. And this is a point made further with what he now then does as he hires himself out. The father is shamed further by his son's uncleanness. Because for Jews, pigs have anything to do with them. Is, is bad enough. It's a symbol of degradation. So not only to, to be working with them, but to long to eat what they would want to eat. He couldn't go any further than this. And falling away and shaming himself and his family. If, if we were to stop here, at this point we could say, man, this kid's a write-off. He's too far gone. He's too lost. And it's like Jesus is saying, look, you think the people I'm hanging out with are bad? Well, let me paint you a picture of what God is like, and I'm going to do it by painting the worst case scenario for a person in in our day and in our age. But Jesus doesn't stop here. Verse 17, when he had come to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants servants. He has this plan to earn his way back into the father's good graces. Verse 20, he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, father, I've sinned against heaven and before you, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe, put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring the fattened calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to celebrate. This is very unexpected. This is startling. Like, look at how much the son had done to the father. All those layers of shame. We should expect verse 20 to say, once the son got near, the father saw him and felt disgust and anger. That would have been normal. That would have been expected. That would have been justified. He's supposed to be mad. That's the culturally appropriate thing here. But no. Look again. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion. Despite all of what the son had done, the father is still looking. Despite all of what the son had done, the father still feels compassion. Before he knows why the son is there, what the son is feeling, what the son's motives are in coming back. For all he knows, he's coming back to do more harm and bring more shame. Before he knows what the son is feeling, the father loves him. And look again, while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. If we were there, if we saw this, time would stand still. Because there is a lot that is happening all at once. And I don't want us to miss this. Like a basketball hurling through midair before it hits the buzzer beater. Like the climax to an epic film. Like the crescendo to a powerful symphony. The father's actions here are unexpected and incredibly amazing. Because look, the father runs, he runs, and this likely means that before anyone from the village can shame the son, intercept him as he works his way through the gauntlet of people who are likely still offended by his actions, the father moves towards him. More than that, the fact that the father runs to meet his son where he's at before he knows the motives of the son, and despite all the mountain of shame that created this broken relationship in the first place, the father adds one more layer of shame to it all. In that world, the act of running for a Middle Eastern man of his stature would have been both awkward and disgraceful. Men like this were far too dignified to run anywhere because they would have to pick up their robes and expose their legs. And and like in that day and age, that is both inappropriate and shameful. The father humiliates himself in what he does and how he does it. All to both welcome his son and to protect him from the further shame of the village. Do we see how amazing this is? 
The son shames the father in becoming lost, but the father shames himself in seeking the lost. And keep in mind, the main point Jesus is trying to make in all of these stories in this setting is that what Jesus does shows us who God is. So like the father has compassion before the son has a chance for confession, so too God acts before we can act. God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Like the father publicly humiliates himself in an unexpected way to both welcome and protect the son, so too God humbles himself. Jesus is already defiling himself in the very place he's telling this story, eating with and welcoming the religiously unclean, and he'll go even further than this. As Philippians 2 would say, Jesus emptied himself by taking the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death, on a cross. A cross, a place where he didn't care if he looked bad or if he looked guilty. He knows what it takes to save those who cannot save themselves. Why do we love Jesus? Because in him we get a clear and a beautiful picture of who God is. The picture is of a God who should not do anything to bring lost people, people who have hurt him and shamed him, to bring them home. But instead, he does everything to make lost people found at a high and humiliating price to himself. The son doesn't even have a chance to work his way back or express that he'll become a servant to repay what he's done. No, the father does it all. God does not want people to be lost. It's not where they're supposed to be. We're supposed to be at home with him. And and did you know that when we do come home, we come home fully restored. Look again at what happens immediately. The son doesn't have time to say his full, full speech. The father cuts him off. There's no earning any of this. I've run to you and I'm going to quickly act so that everyone knows I've fully forgiven you, fully accepted you, fully restored you. Verse 22, the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe, likely the one that belonged to the father himself, a special sign of honor. Put it on him and put a ring on his hand. Rings were signs of authority in that world. And shoes on his feet. This was a sign in in that world that someone was free because only slaves and servants were barefoot. Only those who were sons, not slaves, wore shoes. See, look, the, the son comes to the father in the lowest possible position. But what he receives is the highest position. When people turn, when you and I, if we turn from living life without God and we come to Jesus, we're where we've always belonged. If you've done this, you need to see that you are not an afterthought. You're not a plus one at a party. No, God wants you. You yourself. God does not love you less than than the pastor or or the Christian leader or those who seem super religious. Hear him say, hear him say this so clearly to you today. Don't you see? You are valuable to me. God looks for what he loves. God searches for what he treasures. And that's you. That's all of us. Imagine, imagine the impact that this would have on those who heard the stories, on these repentant sinners. God loves looking for you. God joyfully celebrates when he finds you. And when you come to Jesus, when you move from lost to found, you are, no, you are not a lower class citizen in the kingdom. You, you become, in the Bible's language, more than just a sinner who is saved. You become a saint who is blessed and honored and loved. It's why we would see in, in, in the letters in the New Testament, this language of to the saints. And in one of those letters, we hear language like this, for those who've come to Jesus, all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, because he's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms, because we're united with Christ. And when people move from slave to free, from lost to found, from death to life, God parties. God celebrates. God has joy. The party Jesus is showing is necessary. I mean, remember the setting that this is being told in. The Pharisees and the scribes, they're not joining in on the party. They're grumbling about what Jesus is doing. And this is why the story actually ends in a very important way. 
a way we cannot miss. See, this isn't just the story of one son who is lost. It's a story of two sons who are lost. Look at verse 25. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf, because he's received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, look, these many years I've served you, and I never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, notice he doesn't say my brother, notice when this son of yours came who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. Here's a simple truth. There will be people in your life that frustrate you and hurt you. And if there's anything that current events and social media have helped us to identify, it's, it's, it's who our enemies are. Like, think about it. Every second you spend scrolling is an opportunity to pick a fight. Because there, there, there are people who are different from us. There are people that think about government differently than you. There are people that think about church or, or religion differently than you. There are people who think about their gender differently than you. People who express their sexuality differently than you. People who say what you would not say. People who believe what you would not believe. People who drink what you would not drink. Smoke what you would not smoke. Hurt who you would not hurt. Enemies. Like recently, million, millions of us watched the interview that the royals, that, that Meghan and Harry had with Oprah. And, and we looked at that and we, and, and, and we recoiled as, as a society. A lot of us, you know, if this is true, that this means that in the, one of the most powerful places in the world, people felt hopeless. Hopeless because of character attacks and racism. Hopeless because of relational tension and, and suicidal thoughts. And as, as a dad and as a husband and, and whoever we are, we watch this and we just go, like, like if that were me, I, I wish we could just rewind and, and intervene. Because, because man, how, how, how dare people, how dare an institution, how dare the media, how dare anybody treat people this way? When we see injustice, when we see danger, when we, people, we see people in harm's way, we just want everybody to be okay. And more, more than that, we want everybody to thrive. And, and this is what's so cool. The, the good news of Christianity is that this is actually what God wants. For the hurting, for those who, whose lives feel broken, this is what God would want for those who can't seem to find the last puzzle piece to make them feel well. But this is not the only thing Christianity is. This is not the only thing the gospel is. Now, now think about this. God has a breathtakingly enormous amount of love for us and those that we love. But God also has a tremendous and relentless amount of love for those we do not. For those we consider the villains in our story our enemies. He treasures them to God's passion is for every person to experience the honor and the privilege of being a child in his home. Because this is where every person belongs. Be it those we empathize with and, and, and want you know, to embrace in their pain, those who've been silenced, or those we want to injure because they've caused pain and been the silencers. And honestly, sometimes Rather than see people that our enemies belong, we would just rather see them be gone. And I think that the reverse or accidental tragedy for us as we read Luke 15 is that we look down upon the religious. We look down upon the Pharisees and the scribes and treat them the way that they are treating the tax collectors and the sinners. Be honest. Don't you catch yourself thinking, Jesus, how dare you welcome people like this? How dare you welcome the religious? How dare you seek out the abuser and the racist, the ones who've misrepresented you, don't you know what they've done? And this is why we need to see how this story ends. On top of all the Father has gone through thus far, he once more unexpectedly dishonors himself. As the host of the party, he leaves and interacts with his angry son. 
He said to him, son, which in the original language is actually a different word than has been used thus far. He uses an endearing term. Dear son, you're always with me and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Gently, Jesus wants his critics to understand who God is. He wants them to see that what he does shows them who God is. And both in thought and in action, come join the party and experience the blessing of his love too. Because as Luke will highlight consistently, the Son of Man, a a term the Bible uses for Jesus, came to seek and to save those who were lost. What is God like? If you want to know, look at Jesus. As he says in another gospel, anyone who's seen me has seen the Father. Jesus is the same now as he was then. He loves us and wants to be with us. He wants lost people to come home. Maybe you're like the sheep who who is lost because of your own foolishness. Maybe you're like the lost coin which is lost because of someone else has misplaced or misled you or hurt you at no fault of your own. Maybe you're like the younger son who's lost because of his own rebellion. Or maybe you're like the older son, who although you know, you're an insider in the church, you're really actually disconnected from God and lost yourself. No matter who we are, where we are, we all need the forgiveness of God and the love of God and the work of Jesus are enough to bring us home no matter where we are. So in light of all of what we've read, I think there's one question we could ask ourselves today. Am I where God wants me? to be. Maybe you're lost and you need to come home. You can do that today. You can come to Jesus. You can give your life to him. Lord, I don't want to be lost. I don't want to be disconnected anymore. You can put your trust in Jesus as your Lord and as your Savior, turning to him today. It's a big step. You might need some guidance on how to do that. There's there's a, a website you can visit centralheights.ca slash follow Jesus. There's a, there's a follow Jesus button on our homepage. It'll guide you to begin that today and, and experience the celebration, the party of God as you do. But maybe it's not that we're lost and need to come home. Maybe it's that we're found and we need to help others come home. God is all about embracing people where they are at. So are we. God wants wants every person to experience the the privilege and the blessing of being a child in his home. But would the disillusioned, would the hopeless, would the hurting know that if they came to us? What do we have that we can leverage to join God in his pursuit of those who don't know him yet, who still have yet to come home? What an invitation, what an opportunity, what a reality of this God who loved us first.